Wellington Men's College. So what's the attitude these days? Would the union movement put its hand in its pocket for education and training today? Um, well, the union movement supports the acquisition of portable skills and part of the problem that we have today is that there is a lot of focus on vocational uh, training and in fact the first courses that were delivered by the Working Men's College were courses like algebra, maths, um, you know, fairly generic sorts of uh, education as well as some fairly applied vocational education. And as the economy changes and employers want different specific skills, the broad portable skills are critical and the union movement supports broad transportable skills. So you're not married to the enterprise, you can uh, go from one enterprise to another and thereby increase your bargaining power in the marketplace. Um, of course, one of the significant problems today is that the private sector does not pick up the trade training slack created by privatisation. A lot of our trade training was performed by the public sector, the old SEC, the old Board of Works, all of those um, government departments. Given that they're now privatised, the private sector has not picked up the slack. They've picked up the, the private benefit, but they haven't actually put in the training investment. And so one of the earlier questions would have been, would it have been, would it be easy today to get someone with a conviction an apprenticeship? The real question is, can you actually get someone an apprenticeship? And that's because um, there are a lot of employers not picking up apprenticeships. We've had uh, thousands of agreements with employers that obliged employers to pick up apprentices and we're no longer permitted to have those provisions in our agreements through the operation of the work, cho work Choices legislation. Alan Montague, does Steve identify a weakness in our current system of apprenticeship training? Uh, absolutely. Um, with the privatisation of the gas and fuel, um, a number of uh, jobs went by the by where they were picking up a lot of people and equipping them with skills and they were moving forward. But I think now it's coming to a time where when governments are letting contracts, I think that they should have in those contracts that there's a certain number of apprentices um, that are taken on board. I mean, if we look at um, CityLink, for example, there wasn't an apprentice recruited at all in the, whole, uh, in the whole process of putting that together, and I think that's a blight on the use of public money. Are we doing any better with EastLink or some of the other great infrastructure projects? Well, I doubt not. I mean, uh, we've, we've sent submissions from RMIT to governments recommending some of these provisions, um, and uh, we haven't heard a, a pip or a squeak uh, and any movement in that area. I mean, we have group training companies that could move people around the portable skills to um, assist those processes. And uh, the trade pathway is an excellent pathway. I mean, we're doing a lot of research in that area, proving that the people that do go that particular way lead a pretty healthy and robust life and very highly employed, as you know. We'll pick up on those themes, those problems and some other ones, as well as wrapping up shortly. Just after the break, we'll be back here at the Old Melbourne Magistrates Court for Channel 31 on the big screen at Federation Square and for our RMIT University as we have a look at whether Ned Kelly would have been better reading rather than shooting, better read than dead for Ned Kelly. John Fain with you at the Old Melbourne Magistrates Court for RMIT University and Channel 31 and on the big screen at Federation Square as well. We're workshopping whether or not Ned Kelly may have had a different outcome to his life and Victorian history may have been forever changed if all the events that led to his execution had taken place after the creation of the Working Men's College, which was the predecessor to RMIT University. John Rawlinson, just before the break, we heard that by and large it's hard for apprentices to get a go on the big infrastructure projects that are such a big part of our economy now. Can you explain why won't governments insist that employers on infrastructure projects take on apprentices? Um, I can't actually explain that because it, may, it seems logical to me that, that, would be, that, that they probably should put uh, uh, pressure or at least uh, you know, uh, build in some sort of um, legislation or requirement that we do take on more apprentices. I know that uh, everybody agrees we, we have absolutely underinvested in training and, uh, and training these uh, uh, skilled tradespeople. Um, I think the, the reason that they haven't been taking on apprentices is we're in an environment of, we talk about flexible workforce and, uh, and just-in-time skills, and uh, so everybody wants to be able to get the skills when they need them, but, uh, but, but everybody's forgot that we need to invest in those skills in order for them to be available when we need them. So it's a good question. I don't know why, uh, why governments uh, 
don't put more, um, don't influence uh, you know, large infrastructure projects more to take on uh, apprentices. It's one of the great riddles, one of the great mysteries of our current economy. I just don't understand it. But maybe someone can come up with a solution. Let's just go around the panel before we run out of time and get your concluding remarks on whether or not you think whether Ned Kelly may have had a better life and Victorian history would have been forever changed if he'd come through RMIT as it then was the Working Men's College instead of going off to prison. Verity Bergman, what's your instinctive feeling? Well, unfortunately, the historical evidence and, in fact, debates about um, social bandits such as Ned would say that he couldn't have existed seven years later and that the, the circumstances uh, that produce uh, groups of primitive rebels like Ned uh, had changed. Uh, the Working Men's College, its establishment, was part of a, 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 a maturing of the labour movement and therefore conflict became more institutionalised. So people like Ned with grievances against the system uh, would have joined the Australian Shearers Union uh, formed in 1886. They might, Ned might well have joined um, other labour movement organisations and he wouldn't have been quite so aggrieved because there would have been appropriate channels for his uh, grievances to be voiced and therefore I don't think he would have got quite so mad. Simon Brown Greaves, why do we create the myth and the heroic status for someone who basically was a police killer? Look, it's a really good question. I think people identify with the, the underlying uh, issues here and I think he had a lot of support in the community at that time and I think the average man started to feel that uh, he was uh, dealt a raw prawn, that the whole process by which he was brought to justice was probably unfair and I think it struck a chord and Australians are, are pretty good at uh, supporting the underdog and I think Ned Kelly became one of our great underdogs. Waleed Ali, we've seen in the Middle East Osama bin Laden being treated in much the same way as Ned Kelly is in Australia. Do you accept the parallel? I always get the bin Laden questions. <laughs> um, no, I think there is an important parallel in, in that and, and part of the element that the discussion's missed so far is that we're not, when we're talking about Ned Kelly, talking about simple criminality. I think there's an element of activism to this. There's an element of community consciousness about it, of collective consciousness. Um, and so just as Bin Laden becomes a symbol uh, for collective grievance uh, that's disparate, people who don't even necessarily agree with him will somehow uh, draw some kind of inspiration from him. I think Ned Kelly can work in, in the same sort of way. It's, it's a symbol for a collective type grievance and that's why I think to say if he was educated, um, you know, would that have, have led to a different path? Well, arguably it would have, but perhaps not. Perhaps it, it, what it would have done was given him um, more potent tools to act politically, to act um, in a way that, that um, gave expression to the, the collective grievances that he felt. There's an altruism to what he did um, irrespective of his methods, that, that's kind of driving uh, his behaviour that's different from simple criminality, I think. They've even got the same symbolism. You see Bin Laden has the, uh, the, the turban and the beard, which is much like the tin mask and the armour, I suppose. They play a similar role. They are, yeah, pretty good beard. Not a bad one at all. A bit like Bin Laden, actually, come to think of it. Almost as good as Chaz's at the Chaser. <laughs> Steve Dargaville, what is it about the union movement that they're so attracted to rogues consistently across history? Um, unions understand that uh, working class people are very significantly influenced by their environment. Ned Kelly was the subject of a lot of persecution and that's, I think that's quite clear. Um, I like to think that uh, if Ned did have some training he would have undertaken a course in journalism. I think he would have been a journalist. <laughs> Um, and one of the reasons why I think he would have been a journalist is some, of the, best journalists, coast, yeah. well, some of the best journalists are rogues. And secondly, um, <laughs> he spent quite a lot of time trying to get his message out. And uh, so I would, I would like to think that he would have undertaken a course in journalism. Yes, Ned Kelly is a talkback shock jock. I can just see it now. Lex Lazary, if Ned Kelly got such a raw deal, if it was such an unfair trial, how come there wasn't popular revolt? Oh, I think it's. Uh, I think the parallel with the present is that there was um, a climate of fear. I think uh, certainly people in Melbourne and probably people in the North East, where he would like to have declared the Republic of North East in Victoria, were terrified and uh, regarded any measure that was taken to stop him as being justified and really cared little uh, for the outcome. There were demonstrations out in the streets uh, shortly before his execution, but I think by and large, the, the Kelly story indicates that governments can experience